So in part one, we identified the many causes for Jon Snow's assassination. Bowen Marsh details them extensively throughout A Dance with Dragons. He doesn't like Jon's position on Stannis, the religion of R'hllor, the food shortage crisis, letting the wildlings through the wall, and not sealing the gates. Not to mention Val Satin and the possibility of rising corpses also irks him. And in part one, we identified at least five other men, mostly stewards, who seem to be in on the conspiracy. There's Wick Whittlestick because of the food shortage, Alf of Runnymud because of Jon sending out rangers and not sealing the gates, leading to the death of his friend Garth Greyfeather. There's Clytus, who appears to be a Lannister supporter who thinks that Stannis is a fraud. There's Mully, possibly because of Jon releasing Val, and Left Hand Lou for unknown reasons. Now, there are likely many more in on the conspiracy, but let's start with these men and look at the events of the last John chapter, John 13. By following these men, we can perhaps get a better understanding of how the conspiracy unfolded. Now, on first read, the conspiracy to kill John appears to be a rather sudden and spontaneous thing. Prior to being stabbed, John had just read the pink letter aloud in the Shield Hall where around 250 wildling chieftains and 50 black brothers sat listening. John then announces that he plans on riding to Winterfell to fight Ramsay Bolton, essentially for swearing his Night's Watch oath by interfering with the affairs of the Seven Kingdoms. Immediately after this for swearing in the Shield Hall, John hears a ruckus near Hardin's tower. At the tower, John finds what appears to be One One the Giant killing the Queen's man, Sir Patrick. John is distracted by this, and Wick Whittlestick, Bowen Marsh, and the two mystery men make their move, stabbing him. And so again, on first read, it seems like the Night's Watch is reacting to John breaking his vows. However, there are some serious problems here if we are to believe that this was some sort of spontaneous attack on John. First off, isn't the timing here a bit too convenient? One One the Giant just happens to kill Sir Patrick at this very moment? What a massively lucky break for the conspirators that John was distracted by a seemingly unrelated event. Of course, the initial assumption here is that Sir Patrick was trying to steal Val at this very moment in order to court her in a wildling fashion. And yet we should note that this is violence at Hardin's Tower, which was something that Bowen Marsh had specifically warned against. It's strange that this violence erupted within minutes of the Shield Hall meeting. If Sir Patrick didn't know about the pink letter and John's actions, it's a pretty big coincidence. If he did, why is he trying to steal Val? Val's political importance is completely dependent upon Stannis being king. If Stannis is dead, Val is a nobody. And on top of all this, it's rather strange that the violence is facilitated by the fact that the Night's Watch guards for Hardin's Tower are oddly absent. Our second problem is a motive for Jon's attackers. We went through all of the grievances that Bowen Marsh had against Jon Snow, and there were many, but interfering with the affairs of the Seven Kingdoms is not one of them. In fact, Bowen Marsh specifically believes that the Night's Watch is not neutral. He believes that the Watch should be backing the winning side, the Lannisters. It's Jon Snow and, from what we can tell, Jon Snow alone who believes that the Night's Watch is some neutral party. What's also striking about this is that Jon had just interfered in the affairs of the Seven Kingdoms massively when he married Alice Karstark to Sigourn of Thenn. And do you know who complained about the Night's Watch not being neutral? No one. It wasn't a grievance of anyone. Yes, Bowen Marsh didn't attend the wedding, but this is a man who is not shy about vocalizing his opinion. He didn't make a peep about John imprisoning the Castellan of Carhold and marrying the heir of Carhold to a wildling. So this type of oath-breaking, interfering with the affairs of the Seven Kingdoms, doesn't seem to be a reason for the assassination. Now, it's not that the conspirators didn't have other motives. John does announce at the Shield Hall that the Hardhome expedition is still happening, and this is something that Bowen Marsh was very much against. But Bowen Marsh had known about the expedition for days, so that wouldn't have set him off then and there. There is, of course, the news that Stannis is dead. Bowen Marsh does want to be on the winning side, the Lannister side, so perhaps he fears the optics of John attacking the Boltons. This could work as a motive if it weren't for the third thing that's wrong. So, assuming that the conspirators are trying to rid themselves of John because he supports Stannis, isn't it an astoundingly stupid move to stab John at this point? Why not let John ride off with the wildlings to most likely die at Winterfell? Isn't that what Bowen Marsh wants? To rid himself of John and the wildlings? 
Bo and Marsh could have simply taken control of Castle Black after John and the Wildling Chieftains had left, recalled the Hardhome expedition, and sealed the gates like he wanted. Why attack John now when the Night's Watch is massively outnumbered at Castle Black? In fact, Bo and Marsh's move just seems like suicide. A spontaneous murder of John, who is seen as a Stannis supporter and who Tormund and the Wildlings appear to love, with scores of Queen's men and thousands of Wildlings right there. The Pink Letter even specifically threatens Mel, Selyse, Shireen, Val, and Mance's son. It's essentially a declaration of war against the Queen's men and the Wildlings. Why would Bowen Marsh align himself with Ramsay and against the Queen's men and the Wildlings at this moment? It's sheer idiocy. Really, for Bowen Marsh's actions to make any sense, he would need some sort of plan to deal with the fallout of John's murder. He would need a plan to deal with the Queen's men and the Wildlings. But a plan presupposes that Bowen Marsh and the conspirators had time to formulate it, which would have been impossible if the murder were spontaneous. And so we really must conclude that the assassination of Jon Snow was not spontaneous. The conspirators must have put time and effort into orchestrating their move prior to Jon's reading of the Pink Letter at the Shield Hall. In fact, Bowen Marsh and Wick Whittlestick speaking the line for the watch before stabbing Jon with daggers shows premeditation and planning to some degree. So what exactly were the conspirators planning? How can their actions not be suicidal? And how far back does this plan go? Well, let's for a moment review the events of John 13 and consider when the conspirators could have started planning their assassination. So John 13 begins with John's meeting with Queen Selyse and John requesting men for his planned hardhome expedition, of which he's denied. Now it's fairly clear that the hardhome expedition has been something in the works for at least a day or two, as Torment has gone to Oakenshield to settle it and has promised to bring back 80 men for the expedition. And notably later, John speaks of the meeting at the Shield Hall to discuss the expedition as something he and Torment have already scheduled. So this means that sometime between John 12, when John finds out about Cotter Pike's disaster at Hardhome, and John 13, the Hardhome expedition was announced and the Shield Hall meeting was scheduled. So the conspirators did have a motive to kill John pretty early on, to stop the ranging, and they had a set time and place where John would be. Now importantly, during John's meeting with Solis, John mentions that, according to custom, wildling women are stolen by suitors. Now, John's meeting with Solis seems to be attended by mostly Queensmen, though the hall is crowded, and later we find out that news of the event leaked to at least Tormund. So it seems that the room had some gossips in it. The wildlings knew all about it, and considering Alf of Runnymud converted to the religion of R'hllor, he certainly would know some Queensmen well and thus it seems likely that the conspirators would also know of everything that went down at John's meeting with Solis. This is important as it's likely that not just the Queen's men knew about Sir Patrick's desire to marry Val and his need to steal her. The Wildlings and the Night's Watch likely knew as well. And at this meeting, we find out that the Queen's men will not be assisting the Night's Watch at Hardhome, which means more Black Brothers would need to go. So, after the meeting with Solis, John has a discussion with Melisandre where she tells him to cancel the ranging. It's difficult to tell if anyone is around them, but I would assume that this is a private conversation as John makes mention of the mission to rescue Arya, a rather sensitive topic. What is significant about this meeting is that it ends with Melisandre telling John to look to the skies, which John later interprets as her seeing a raven arrive. Now, John assumes that Mel saw this in her flames as a vision of the future, but Mel's flames can also show the present and the past, and Mel may have simply looked out the window and saw Raven come in. I bring this up as the pink letter may have already arrived. In fact, Clytus brings the letter not too long after this meeting. So after speaking with Mel, John has a quick exchange with the wildling black brother Leathers. John wonders aloud how many men the Night's Watch should send on the ranging. 100, 200, 500, 1,000. Let's remember that the Great Ranging was 300 men and that was a disaster, and John is talking about a similar type of expedition. One can imagine how Great Ranging survivors like Left Hand Lou would feel about this. John then tells Leathers that there's much to decide and to spread the word. So at this point, it's no secret that John is considering a large ranging party to Hardhome. After Leathers, John runs into Mully and Falk the Flea outside his chambers. Ghost seems to have a serious problem with Mully at this point, and so we have a clue that something is already amiss and that Ghost can smell it. What's interesting here is that Ghost's mistrust of Mully seems to precede John's meeting with Selyse, Mel, and Leathers. 
the conspirators were already planning something, it seems, before the events of John 13. John then sends off Satin to get some mulled wine and to summon Bowen Marsh and Awful Yarwick. The men discuss the ranging, and Bowen Marsh is extra insubordinate, saying that the mission is suicide and that John should let the wildlings at Hardhome die. Curiously, Bowen Marsh ignores the mulled wine, although Awful Yarwick drinks two cups. We will talk more about this mulled wine in part three, but it's important to note that both Clytus and Three Finger Hob mull wine. Anyway, the meeting with Bowen Marsh and Awful Yarwick ends poorly, with ghosts sniffing the men and showing an upraised and bristled tail. With dogs, this is called piloerection and is a sign of aggression. Ghost again mistrust someone, seemingly Marsh and Yarwick. After the meeting, Awful Yarwick and Bowen Marsh want to get some snow shoveled away from the storeroom's ice cells and the stairs up the wall. After being unhelpful and obstructionist before, Bowen Marsh suddenly has a can-do and obedient attitude, mobilizing ten stewards and even one one the giant to shovel the snow. The snow shoveling is a curious little event. John feels the area needs to be dug out for fear that the prisoners in the ice cells will smother. Though I do question whether they would, as there are likely worm ways that lead to the ice cells underground. All of Castle Black is supposedly connected by these wormways, and they certainly do connect to the storerooms next to the ice cells. And interestingly enough, it's the stewards who are already making use of these passages. And so it's interesting and a bit suspicious that Alpha Yarwick and Bowen Marsh felt it important to shovel the snow here. After the shoveling, Tormund arrives, having already heard about Garrick Kingsblood. Tormund and John begin to talk about the ranging when they are interrupted by Mully, who, as we mentioned before, Ghost didn't trust. Mully only peeks his head into John's chambers, perhaps still fearing the direwolf. So Mully interrupts the two because Mully wants John to see Clytus about a letter that we come to find out is the pink letter. John wants to put off reading the letter, but Mully is rather insistent, claiming that Clytus looks scared, and so John agrees to see him. And at this point, John receives the pink letter from Clytus, which has a smear of pink wax on its outside. Now our author spends a lot of time describing seals on letters, and of course a smear of pink wax offers no assurance that this letter hasn't been opened already. And it should be noted that a previous letter from Ramsay had a button of pink wax. It's difficult to definitively say when this letter arrived and whether or not it's been opened, but Melisandre mentioning a raven earlier in the day and the smear of pink wax makes one suspect that this letter arrived and was opened much earlier. Molly is then ordered to take Clytus back to his chambers while John reads the pink letter to Tormund. John and Tormund then talk for two hours. Now, two hours is a long time, and it's perhaps possible that Molly or anyone else was able to eavesdrop on Tormund and John's discussion. It's difficult to say as we have no real idea how large the armory is or its layout, or if Molly and Fulk the Flea were able to come back inside with John's return. But of course, within this two hours, quite a bit of communication and planning can occur with the conspirators. At the end of the two hours, John finds that Molly and Fulk the Flea have been replaced by Horse and Rory. John then starts to head to the Shield Hall and has to wrestle Ghost back inside to prevent him from coming with him. Ghost appears to want to protect John. At the Shield Hall, about 250 wildlings are in attendance, as are 50 crows, including Bowen Marsh, Wick Whittlestick, Alf of Runnymud, Left Hand Lou, Alful Yarwick, and a number of builders. John reads the pink letter and announces to everyone that he will be heading to Winterfell with the wildlings, and that Tormund will be leading the Night's Watch to Hardhome. Quite significantly, Tormund will be leading as many crows as he requires. After this, the Night's Watch leaves the Shield Hall, leaving only the Wildling Chieftains there, and John leaves to find Solis, but then hears a scream at Hardin's Tower. Horse Rory and John run there and find what appears to be Sir Patrick being killed by One One, who has cuts on his belly and arms. Queensmen, Northmen, and Free Folk arrive on the scene, but curiously, very few Night's Watch. John tries to keep everyone back, but then John is stabbed by the conspirators. And so, going through the events of the day, we can see that the conspirators actually had plenty of time to put a plot together. Their motive was established rather early, before the day had even begun. John had planned on sending the Night's Watch to Hardhome, a suicide mission. And this was planned ever since the letter from Cotter Pike in John 12. And quite early in John 13 at the Sleece meeting, it's revealed that the Queen's men are not going to help out with Hardhome. Immediately afterwards, John sends Leathers out to spread the word about this, and reveals to him that it may be a very large ranging party to Hardhome. John then doesn't listen to the protests of Bowen Marsh and Awful Yarwick about the ranging. 
and if anyone happened to be eavesdropping on John and Tormund's meeting, it would have been confirmed that it was, in fact, going to be a very large ranging. Not to mention, if the pink letter had been opened, there was a smear of pink wax, then the conspirators would have a second motive to attack John in order to distance themselves from Stannis. Of course, the one big piece of evidence that something was amiss prior to the Shield Hall is the fact that Ghost mistrusted Mully, Bowen Marsh, and Athel Yarwick fairly early in the day and wanted to follow and protect John prior to the Shield Hall meeting. But besides this, we do have some smaller hints of things being simply off earlier. Bowen Marsh not wanting to drink wine, he and Athel Yarwick's desire to shovel snow, Mully's insistence that John see Clytus, the smear of pink wax on the pink letter, Melisandre telling John to look to the skies. And all of these occurred before a two-hour window of time that the conspirators had to plot and scheme. And this was followed by a scheduled event that they knew their target would be at. Okay, so Bowen Marsh and his conspirators have a plan of some sort. This incident at Hardin's Tower might not be a coincidence. So what exactly is this plan? How on earth are they going to get out of this predicament, outnumbered and surrounded by Queen's men and wildlings who are ready to kill them? Well, next time we will outline what I think Bowen Marsh is up to, and how he has a shot at winning the coming conflict at the Wall. We will talk about Bowen Marsh's master plan in part three. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.